सवितूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप ओम तत्सूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप सत्यम सत्यम 
सवितूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप ओम तत्सूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदी सत्य नदी Yeah. 
Welcome tonight to this very special occasion. I believe we have just about everybody on mute and their camera off. If you can just check very quickly to make sure and at uh, any point that we will be bringing someone in, we will go ahead and turn on their mic and their video. So thank you all very much. It looks like we've got uh, 15 or, or 16 folks joining us. We're so very glad that you can be here tonight. This event, as you know, is being held at the Lagrasse Center in Fountain Inn, South Carolina, and hosted by the Sri Aurobindo Center Southeast. I am here with my colleague, Vladimir Yatsenko, who lived in Naraville well over 25 years, and he will be sharing a few words with us and the group a bit later. We are also joined here tonight by members of the Rama family. So we gather this evening in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the mother's return to Pondicherry on April 24th, 1920. It was from this time forward that the mother and Sri Aurobindo worked in unison to bring down higher forms of consciousness that could radically and permanently transform Earth consciousness. And within six years, there was a descent to the overmental consciousness, at which time Sri Aurobindo withdrew into seclusion concentrate on the next step of his yoga, the descent of the supermental consciousness. It was at this time that Sri Aurobindo handed over all responsibilities of the ashram to the mother. So let us open this evening with the darshan message. We'll follow this with a short silent meditation and end the silent meditation at the sound of the chime of a bell. The mother, as the mother approached Pondicherry, I was on the boat at sea, not expecting anything, when all of a sudden, abruptly, about two nautical miles from Pondicherry, the quality, I mean, even say the physical quality of the atmosphere, of the air, changed so much that I knew we were entering the aura of Sri Aurobindo. It was a physical experience, and I guarantee that whoever has a sufficiently awakened consciousness can feel the same thing. Sri Aurobindo. That she should come here and work with me for a common goal was, as it were, a divine desperation. She has helped and is helping to give a concrete form to my yoga. This would not have been possible without her cooperation. One of the two great steps in this yoga is to take refuge in the mother.
So we are very pleased here tonight to have joining us from his home in Cleveland, Georgia, Nodded. And Nodded will be reading a passage from Savitri. Okay, Nodded, maybe just say a couple couple words to make sure we can hear you. Yes. Um, it's very beautiful here right now. I've just been out in the mother's garden looking at so many beautiful flowers and joining them in their prayer. Dear friends, disciples, and devotees, the passage I will read today is one that first describes savagery. In book one, the book of beginnings, Canto two, the issue. Before I begin, I would like to share with you some comments from my dear friend, Amal Kiran. He writes in his book on Sri Aurobindo's savagery, quote, I remembered also that I had asked Sri Aurobindo what plane a certain passage in Savitri. The description of Savitri herself in Canto Two of Book One had come from. Very grudgingly, he had admitted it to have come from the overmind, or rather the overmind intuition as he very cautiously used to label the source of the highest poetry in his own words. End quote. Amal also quotes the lines beginning with, quote, as in a mystic and dynamic dance, as the mantra of mantras. And in the letters on Savitri, Sri Aurobindo writes, this passage is, I believe, what I might call the overmind intuition, expressing itself in something like its own rhythm and language. He later writes that, quote, it is difficult to say about one's own poetry, but I think I have succeeded here and in some passages later on, in catching that very difficult note. In separate lines, or briefer passages, that is, a few lines at a time, I think it comes in not unoften." End quote. Amal writes that the above was Sri Aurobindo's reply to the question which he, Amal, regarded as the ne plus ultra. In English, it may be translated of, as of which there is nothing higher or greater in world poetry. For me too, this passage, the first lengthy description of savagery, ending with the God of love being able to dwell in her, and finding in her his own eternity has sung to my soul for nearly 60 years. And I humbly share it with you on this Darshan day. As in, in <clears throat> sorry as in a mystic and dynamic dance, a priestess of immaculate ecstasies, inspired and ruled from truth's revealing vault, moves in some prophet cavern of the gods, a heart of silence in the hands of joy, inhabited with rich creative beats, a body like a parable of dawn that seemed a niche for veiled divinity 
or golden temple door to things beyond. Immortal rhythms swayed in her time-born steps. Her look, her smile, awoke celestial sense, even in earth stuff, and their intense delight poured a supernal beauty on men's lives. A wide self-giving was her native act a magnanimity as of sea or sky, enveloped with its greatness all that came and gave a sense as of a great and world. Her kindly care was a sweet, temperate sun, her high passion a blue heaven's equipoise. As might a soul fly, like a hunted bird, escaping with tired wings from a world of storms, and a quiet reach like a remembered breast, in a haven of safety and splendid soft repose, one could drink life back in streams of honey fire, recover the lost habit of happiness, feel her bright nature's glorious ambience and preen joy in her warmth and colors rule. A deep of compassion, a hushed sanctuary, her inward help unbarred a gate in heaven. Love in her was wider than the universe, the whole world could take refuge in her single heart. The great, unsatisfied Godhead here could dwell. Vacant of the dwarf self's imprisoned air, her mood could harbor his sublimer breath, spiritual, that can make all things divine. For even her gulfs, were secrecies of light. At once, she was the stillness and the word, a continent of self-diffusing peace, an ocean of untrembling virgin fire, the strength, the silence of the gods were hers. In her, he found a vastness like his own, his high, warm, subtle ether he refound and moved in her as in his natural home. In her, he met his own eternity. Namaste all and thank you can you hear me by the way yes um it was a most beautiful passage from savitri um i would like to introduce a film made by um by uh, alok uh, he created this message uh, on this occasion of mother's final arrival in Pondicherry. Um, a few words before that, I would like to mention that, you know, that mother first arrived in 1914 and then six years she was absent. She was not there. She traveled to Japan and stayed in Japan for, uh, for nearly uh, six years and when she left Sri Aurobindo you remember when she met Sri Aurobindo first time she said that she recognized in him that divinity she always worshipped in her uh, childhood and she met him long before and uh, she recognized him immediately and he recognized her and she made this pranam yeah which was uh, striking Sri Aurobindo because Sri Aurobindo never saw any such pranam ever made total surrender 
And when she left, because there was sec the First World War, she had to leave uh, to Japan. Uh, she said that she left with Sri Aurobindo her, own, her psychic being. And it is really something which is unheard of, to leave your psychic being um, with Sri Aurobindo. For six years she lived in Japan with her psychic being, being in Pondicherry. And on her arrival back, on her return in 1920, on the 24th of uh, April, when she was uh, arriving already two miles before in the sea, she felt that presence of Sri Aurobindo. And uh, it makes me think that her psychic being there with him <laughs> also could feel that, um, that presence. Yeah, it's. I have to speak louder. They say, um, but this is uh, the hundred years from that time, hundred years of this final arrival, which changed the whole world, because from that time on, Sri Aurobindo started active yoga. From 1914 to 1920, he was writing all his books. This beautiful books, Life Divine, Synthesis, Secret of the Veda, uh, Essays on the Gita, great creations. But they were all made in the pause, in the time when mother was absent. He was waiting for her. And when she arrived, they started this marvelous journey for all of us. Then he stopped writing when she arrived. Um, so with these few words, I would like us to uh, listen to the message by Alok Pandey, which is very beautiful and luminous. So I will switch to this uh, pre-recorded message and we will uh, listen to it. Let me prepare it. Twenty fourth April is one of the darshan days in the ashram and it is regarded as such in the community centered around Sri and the mother. The mother spoke of this day or rather revealed its significance as the tangible sign of a sure victory over the adverse forces. So what is special about this day? Now at a most outward level if you really see the coming together of mother and Sri is the beginning of a great synthesis. In fact, each and every action of Mother and Sri has left, in the words of Sri in Savitri, the footprints of a God. So all that they have done, all that they have written, all that they have, wherever they have stepped, has become a place, a center, or a mark, or a pathway along which humanity is bound to follow. And we can take number of examples, but to focus on the issue here, the coming together of Mother and Sri as we see is the coming together most outwardly of the West and the East. If we take again Indian thought, the masculine and the feminine side, they come together. And there we go into the deeper secret of their union. Indeed, in creation, in the divine himself, though he is one, there are two sides, two aspects, known in India as Ishwara and Ishwari, the Lord and his Shakti, Prakriti and Purusha, Brahman and Maya. And they are two sides of one reality. If we approach him from the masculine side, then we enter into the realization of Brahman and the Ishwara who stands behind. But if we approach him from the Prakriti side, from the feminine side, then we discover the tremendous dance of Shakti which stands behind the entire creation, all the processes, the knowledge and power that has gone into creation. And this is the uniqueness about the mother and Shurabindo. Shurabindo is the supreme Purusha, the Purushottama of the Gita, who is the witness self who yet holds creation upon his breast. He stands silent, sanctioning all that is happening and yet he is untouched, unmoved, like the sun who stands above in the sky, 
सूर्यो यथा सर्वलोक से चक्षु न लिप्यते चाक्षुषे बाह्य दोषा एट द सेम टाइम एंड ऑन द अदर हैंड द डिवाइन मदर रिप्रेजेंट्स द शक्ति द नॉलेज एंड द पावर दैट हैज गॉन इन टू क्रिएशन एंड इज ऑर्गेनाइजिंग ऑल द प्रोसेस इन द डिटेल्स ऑफ इट्स लाइफ सो वॉट इज न्यू अबाउट इट आफ्टर ऑल हैज इट नॉट बीन हैपनिंग ऑल द टाइम वेल here she of indo tells said that there this is a great transition moment thus far the divine shakti has not been acting directly in all its glory in all its effulgence in all its splendor and power but rather indirectly through an inferior instrument or if we may put it through its own daughter through a limited through a limited and divided consciousness what we call as nature or prakriti which is mostly acts mechanically partly conscious partly unconscious and yet behind it there is a perfect consciousness which limits itself to the needs of a species but now this play has to go further the purusha also wears a diminished godhead here in creation he becomes the little psychic spark lost in the crypts of nature dragged by prakriti now to your heights now to the abysses and he goes helplessly tied like a slave this game has taken us so far but now the terms have to change the purusha within the being no bigger than the thumb of man has to recover and discover its own godhead the ishwara but also the prakriti which is nothing else but a diminished form of the mahashakti above has to once again regain and recover her own glory and splendor so shirobinda and the mother come together to activate it to start this process this new cycle of evolution where on the one side the purusha aspect the soul involved in nature will not only be liberated but reach its highest heights of possibility going through all these stations of consciousness where it will recover some form of itself it will go to the very birthplace of the jivatma the supramental godhead and recover and discover its supramental godhead its supramental personality on the other hand nature within us toiling and struggling in darkness will also throw off its dark veil get rid of the division and the separation and once again ascend to its home of oneness light truth bliss sweetness and love so this is the coming together of mother and shirobindo and that's when this new process starts first within them and then it will spread more and more through a contagion in the rest of creation in fact together we see a very beautiful in many ways the most perfect relation that is possible in mother and shirobindo for the mother shirobindo is the lord and it is she who installed the divine master in the temple of yoga or rather in the temple of earth as the master of yoga she is the one when she came she taught everyone how to sit before the master how to be before him how to love him how to adore him how to worship him how to serve him she forgot herself totally in his worship but at the same time on the side of shirobindo he taught us or rather he installed the divine mother as the guiding and moving force of her nature as the shakti who shall henceforth govern and move this human nature along the pathways that are intended and willed by the divine so this too we find as beautiful and majestically in their relation and very interestingly shobindo speaks about it and i would like to read something very interesting the about the this change of relationship which takes place between the two first someone has seen a dream in which he sees shobindo and the mother as ishwara and shakti or rather a vision and shobindo says the mother and myself stand for the same power in two forms so the perception in the dream was perfectly logical 
Ishwara Shakti, Purusha Prakriti are only the two sides of the one divine. But in the lower creation, we see the Shakti has become Prakriti and she is on the left side. Whenever we see the images of the gods with their Shakti, we see Parvati, Radha or Sita seated on the left side. But this is because Prakriti is still not yet, she has not recovered the glory. So she takes creation and offers it to the Purusha. This is her work. So the yoga was also like that. Even the high, one of the widest paths, the path of the Gita, is a continuous gathering up of things and offering it to the Lord, the Ishwara. But now we have gone back to the original term. This offering of Prakriti starts when once it touches rock bottom. But in the beginning it is not like that. The divine wills and Shakti goes forth out to fulfill his will, his intent. So, therefore, the Shakti comes to the right side. She is the one who executes the divine's will. There is no more of offering required, but simply an opening to the Shakti, because she is the upbearer and the upholder of the divine will. And to open to her means to automatically get the sanction of the divine. So, Sri Aurobindo changed the rules of the game. Rather, set it right and put put it in the right way. So the disciple asks a question, is there any significance in mother's standing on the right side and your standing on the left in my experience? So like this, we see the darshan photograph and the first combined darshan which took place on 24th November 1926, the Siddhi day, it's described beautifully that Sri sat and he was on, a, on his chair and the mother came and sat on his stool, which was on to the right side and slightly below. And Sri was holding his hand, lifting his hand and kept it behind the mother. Whereas all the disciples came and they were touching their feet and it was the mother who was blessing them. It is as if Sri was blessing through the mother. So this is the right relation. And Sri answers, Yes, she is the executive power and must have the right arm free for action. Anything that the mother sanctioned or said had Sri implicit sanction to it. It is a very beautiful experience of the mother where she goes to Sri it's in 1959. And she tells him all, you know, the world is not ready. She asks Sri she speaks of the world of truth and she, Tells, her, tells him all the plans. And she says, Sri doesn't say a word. What does he do? He picks up three combs and puts them on three sides of his head. And then he ex the mother says that it meant that Sri was telling her, I adopt all your conceptions. Whatever you have conceived, whatever you have willed, I accept it. At the same time, he just said two words. When mother asked, when will this world of truth, which is so near as a lining to the world of falsehood, to this physical world, when will it manifest? And Sri simply said, not ready. So she is given the task of making it ready. This symbolism which puts her on the left side belongs to the ignorance. In the ignorance, she is on the left side. Not free in her action. All is a wrong action. Or half result. For the supramental work, the true symbol is the mother on the right side. Then, another very interesting question and answer. Someone has asked Shirobindo, Can it happen that one who is open to Shirobindo is not open to the mother? Is it that whoever is open to the mother is open to Sri Aurobindo. It's a very interesting question. That if I am open to Sri Aurobindo, does it mean that I may not be open to the mother? And if I am open to the mother, does it mean that I may not be open to Sri Aurobindo? And this reply is an eye opener and a soul opener. Sri Aurobindo says, well, the question is, is it that one who is open to Sri is not open to the mother. Is it that whoever is open to the mother 
is open to Shurabindo and Shurabindo says the mother proposition is true. All who are open to the mother are open to Shurabindo. If one is open to Shurabindo and not to the mother, it means that one is not really open to Shurabindo. So, so beautifully he has said about this relation. And this is the true relation. You know, uh, the other day we were reading about this vision and I feel like reading it again. When mother came on 29th March, she speaks about that she had had several visions before coming here and he recognized, she recognized in Shurabindo as the being whom she had seen and called Krishna. And then she said that when she came back on 24th April, she describes it beautifully, something happened and she knew, yes, that's the culmination of the vision. So the vision was very interesting. She saw first time that she is in a house and there is um, her family, which of course is very symbolic because they were not the real family. There was the father who represented the old creation like Daksh Prajapati and Sati. And there were two brothers who were unruly, just like the old creation, the vital, the powers which have emerged from him, old creation. And she is there as a young girl who is sitting on the window gazing afar. And then suddenly she is looking on the other side whereas the father and brother are looking towards the door. And she sees that from the other side where she is gazing, there enters he resplendent in a being of light. And they can't see him because they are looking to the other side. It reminded me of those lines in Savitri. Thus shall the mass transcendent mount his throne when darkness deepens strangling the earth's breast. And man's corporeal mind is the only guide as a thief's in the night shall be the covert tread. She recognizes and indeed she is the one who first recognized even those who were near Sri Aurobindo. They felt there is something great but that was it. They yet treated him like a friend and a comrade just like Arjuna. But she, the moment she saw him, she knew and she wrote, He whom we saw yesterday is here upon earth. Much later when Sri was asked, because these two people asked that, you know, uh, did Sri recognize her? Of course, when Barinda asked him, he said, the first thing I noticed was that Mira is born free. She had no trappings, no tyings, no attachments. At the same time, he also saw for the first time, I saw perfect and integral surrender route right down to the very physical cells of the body. And I knew the time has come for the integral realization and the divine life to be established. So in that vision, she first thing she does is she bows down and touches, in fact, kisses the feet of that resplendent being. And then she sees that the father, the old creation, goes and embraces him. And when he comes back, he is a transformed being. And therefore, she says, his presence is enough to know that days come, will come when all this will be transformed. Because she had seen it. And then she knew that there is nothing impossible for him. And then, when she touches the feet, he lifts her up. And the two stand together, her head almost touching his shoulder. And they are gazing into the vast. And then mother sees that they, the energies of the two. She says in the vision that that child was myself, that girl was myself. And the two, their energies balance each other and spread far and wide, transforming creation. So this was the vision. So first part of the vision came true when on 29th March she saw Sri and she recognized that yes, it is he. The same gesture, the same person, the same eyes, the same attire. But then this was not the end. She says that this was only the beginning. I came here, but something in me wanted to meet Sri all alone for the first time. So she goes for the first time and she sees, I saw in his eyes that it was he. He was standing exactly my vision. Dressed the same way, in the same position, in profile, his head held high. He turned his head towards me and I saw in his eyes that it was he. The two things clicked, the decisive shock. 
but this was merely the beginning of my vision. So first part is realized. Then she goes, there is a series of experience, experiences a 10 months sojourn in Pondicherry, five years of separation, then the return to Pondicherry and the meeting in the same house and in the same way did the end of the vision occur. So what was the end of the vision? The two together, they stand, merge and gaze into the vast and she is standing by the side of his shoulder. So she says beautifully, I was standing just beside him. 24th April. My head wasn't exactly on his shoulder, but where his shoulder was. This is how the vision was. We were standing side by side like that, gazing out through the open window. And then together, at exactly the same moment, we felt... Now the realization will be accomplished. That the seal was set and the realization would be accomplished. Had she not seen the second part of the vision come to fulfillment in this life, she would not have been sure. So she spoke about a tangible sign. That the seal was set and the realization would be accomplished. I felt the thing descending massively within me. With the same certainty I had felt in my vision. From that moment on, there was nothing to say. No words. Nothing. We knew it was that. This is a journey they have oft undertaken. We know there was another vision of this sadhika who saw suddenly the marriage of Shiva and Parvati taking place and all the animals and gods, they are rushing towards uh, uh, the Kailash. This is a, actually a story, it's narrated as story she saw while gazing at the sea. And then when she was sees, everybody has come towards this side. And so he says, there will be imbalance. So somebody has to go and balance the other side. And who else but Rishi Agast, one of the Saptrishis. So he calls him and says, you and Lopa Mudra have to go that side. And you have to balance creation. And... They are, of course, they also want to witness the marriage. And Shiva assures the boon that whenever you want, we'll be there together. And of course, we know about the bowing of the Vindhyas and their going. Now, this is a very symbolic story as I see it. One, when Shiva assures that you will witness the marriage, actually they witness the true marriage. The marriage of Shiva and Parvati is the marriage of the divine soul and earth nature, material nature. It is a symbol of that. And much later in the life of Agastin Lopa Mudra, now as Shurabinda and the mother, at the same place where now this ashram stands, was his ashram and where the Samadhi is, that was his Yagnavedi, that's where the fulfillment takes place. Something which was foreseen of old. And when they are going down, is all the knowledge which was proud of itself, when there means knowledge, Going up and up and up and blocking the sky and cutting the integral truth. Going down before Rishi August, Discovering the integral reality in the light of the supramental sun. This too we see being fulfilled in its fullest form. And this is just one of the lives. Many lives together they have striven in various names and forms. And now the hour has come for the final and decisive victory. Because the last work of the adverse forces is to create a hiatus between world and the divine. Between creation and the creator. They go on saying that all these inner experiences are fine. But you will never be able to bridge it or manifest it in outer life. And this has been the big problem. It's not that people have not had great inner realizations. But when it came to earthly life and manifesting it, they used to fail. It remained what it was, a field of ignorance. But this time, it is the Divine Shakti herself who has taken the charge. And therefore, it was the tangible sign of the sure victory over the adverse forces which have always created this division. So let me close with something which...
which is a wonderful advice, spiritual advice to all of us. Why should we know about all this? Why don't we just read the book on yoga and practice the yoga as per the almanac? Well, there are two approaches of yoga. One is as per the scripture. And that's where we have a tendency to form a religion. And another where we simply turn towards Mother and Sri and they do the yoga for us. And unfortunately, people think that creates a religion. Well, that does not create a religion. Religion is created if you see the entire history when people are confined to the book and then there are interpretations. There are cults around books, various interpretations, ideologies and they even fight and kill each other over the book. But when it comes to the divine personality, then there is unity. Where can be the where can be the possibility of division when it comes to the divine personality of Krishna or Jesus? And of course now the divine personality of the mother in Shirobindu. So here is the disciple asking, Mother, Shirobindu has always said that you, you are within us. The mother says, Yes, it is true, perfectly right. Me, I am there as a presence in the eternal flame. The power that animates and initiates the action. The peace that renders all sweet and peaceful. The joy that overflows and sublimates. The light that purifies and the vibration that sanctions. Sri is there as a sustaining entity and me, I am there like a guide. In fact, it is the same identity into one who observes the witness and the other that effectuates the Shakti. So long as one has not realized that, one cannot understand anything. Yes, my child, he who recognizes Sri and me, in fact, it is the same thing, the same identity. For him, all obstacles, all difficulties, all traps, all these so-called interruptions on the march towards the truth are swept away and removed forever. In this life, as well as after death, and in the lives to come, till eternity, one can draw a parallel. There are religions, and I don't want to name them, where there is no mention of Shakti. One has to only rely on the Purusha and the teachings. Whereas we see very interestingly, that at least with regard to two avatars, we see there is a play of the Shakti, so much so that there is a whole, um, whole side of approach to Krishna and it is said that you cannot realize Krishna unless you have pleased Radha. And similarly we see in the story of Rama and Sita, there is a whole version of Ramayana which mentions that Ravana was not finally destroyed by, by Rama. Every time he was destroyed, Something like his shadow kept emerging and his final destruction was by Sita assuming the form of Kali. So we see that there is in India this thought that the Ishwara and the Shakti together are required for the annihilation of all darkness. Just one is not enough. And this is the thought we find here once again. But arriving at its finality, those he who recognizes Sri and me as one, all obstacles are swept away and removed forever. In this life as well as after death and in the lives to come till eternity. So much so that she has gone on to say that when you begin to see us as one, when to bow before Sri is to bow before me and to turn to me is to turn towards Sri then you begin to be ready to open to the supramental force. This is the sign that one is open to the supramental force. And finally, something very beautiful 
which we can stop and enter for the darshan day yes for him the lord is all powerful because he is there with all his power what does such a devotee do what is he supposed to do what is the practice of yoga enjoined for such a person she says only to repeat ma shirobindu ma shirobindu ma shirobindu ma shirobindu ma shirobindu that is enough
चैतन्यमयी सत्यमयी सवितूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप ओम तत्सूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप सवितूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप ओम तत्सूर भरम रूप ज्योति पर धीम सत्य नदीप सत्य नदीप सत्य 
This brings us to the close of our program tonight. We appreciate all of you coming together and being part of this virtual community. And we look forward to future meetings. Special thanks goes out to Nodded for the reading of Savitri. Mm -hmm. And to let each of you know that both Alok and Nodded each week are doing short weekly messages that we are posting on the Lagrasse Center webpage. And these are short inspirational sayings in the light of Sri Aurobindo and the mothers in Tegu Yoga. They're very helpful uh, and inspirational during these times. So please take a look. And if you're not already on our email list, just uh, send me, if you will, your uh, email address or even within the chat box here in Zoom just before leaving go ahead and, and put your email and we'll make sure you're on the list. And again, we thank all of you so very much for joining us tonight on this very special occasion. Namaste.